Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, I'm the Reverend Todd Weir. I'm the pastor here. And on behalf of the Peace and Justice Committee of this congregation, I would like to welcome all of you and uh, introduce our panel. First off, why are we here? Well, if you're here for air conditioned comfort, you're in the wrong place. If you're here because you're uncomfortable with poverty, you're in the right place. If you're here because you're uncomfortable with hunger, you're in the right place. If you're here because you're uncomfortable with unemployment, you're in the right place. And if you hunger for justice, you're in the right place. So welcome. This is, uh, has been traditionally the meeting house of Northampton. Uh, way back in the 16th century, uh, this would have been where decisions were made and court cases happened. And we want to try to keep that tradition going by having this be a place of discourse where people meet to discuss important issues. And so that you can have a part in this, we are going to pass out note cards. If questions come up, uh, at the end, we will have time for some questions. Um, I'll sort through the cards, and I may put some together, and I may change your question and put it with someone else's and uh, edit it a little bit. We want to try to get as much of what you want to know about uh, up to our panel after they've had some time to uh, make their presentations. Uh, the format, we will uh, hear for about five minutes from each of our uh, local folks who run organizations that are on the front lines here in our area, working on all the various aspects to alleviate poverty. And uh, then we will have our keynoter for 20 minutes. Um, and uh, David Enton, the chair of our committee, uh, when you hear this bell, you will know that you have one minute. And yeah, I'm speaking to you now, okay? So you hear the bell, you know you still got one minute, and then you'll hear a bell when your time is up. And we want to, you know, you'll get another chance to go around if you missed anything during the question and answer time. Let me take a moment to introduce them, and then we will get rolling. Uh, starting here from my left, John Weissman, Jobs with Justice. Let's give him a big hand. I think there's a few Jobs with Justice folks here tonight, am I right? Okay, good. Uh, Andrew Morehouse is here, Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. Welcome, Andrew. Uh, Wander Alone with ServiceNet and the uh, shelter right down the street. Welcome. Welcome. Claire Higgins from Community Action. And of course, our new congressman, James McGovern. <laughs> congressman McGovern has stood up on the House floor, what, 13 times now in, in support of SNAP benefits. And uh, those are the food stamp benefits, now SNAP benefits. And uh, you should go to YouTube and uh, put that in YouTube and look him up and watch those speeches. They're phenomenal, and we're looking forward to hearing all of you tonight. And uh, let's go ahead and begin. And I think we'll just go in order that you're seated. That seems to be uh, the simplest. Uh, John, we're going to let you start. And he has some handouts I hope you all got. He has charts and graphs to follow along. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. And as I prepared for this, I had in mind immediately the third uh, the graph, the third uh, illustration in what we're handing out. And then I thought about all the other ways that this has been graphically presented and that I've been impressed by. And then I thought, why not give you all the graphics? And then I thought, why not give you my remarks too? It's why it's a, We'll read them and uh, comment on them a little bit uh, and stray from them. Do we want to uh, switch mics? Uh, these are for the video recording. Okay, that's the video. Also, because we are on video. Go up there? We can't see you. Yeah, whatever. We'll do it from that point? That's fine. 
Yeah. Now, <laughs> they can't see you seated. I think they want to move this. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Is that good? If, if people, we all want the uh, podium. Yeah. No. You'll give them a minute. Okay. David's going to give you time. No, no, no. You, uh, as soon as he's ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, I started out by pointing out that um, one out of five American families reported last year that not a single family member had a job. I think in many communities we don't see unemployment. And we walk down the street and we think, well, unemployment is whatever the official statistic is. And it's getting better in Massachusetts. Um, so I wanted you to have these statistics. More than a third of our working age population is no longer even in the job market. So as we walk down the street, we don't know who's actually in the job market and counting on, on the, uh, for that statistic or against it. Only 58.6% of us are employed. But the opposite way, 41% of the potential workforce of America is not working. Lately, when the official unemployment rate dips as it did in April to 7.5%, it's not about people getting jobs, it's about people dropping out of the labor market, which you, uh, you know numerator over denominator is going to change the statistic in a positive manner. Jim Hightower recently wrote, Corporate chieftains deliberately exacerbate this crisis, the crisis by hoarding trillions of dollars that ought to be rushed into job-creating expansions. And politicians add to the casualties by gleefully firing hundreds of thousands of teachers, firefighters, police, and other valuable public employees. And maybe it's not so gleeful in Northampton where you have to do an override to uh, keep your budget in any kind of semblance of social service, but we know that the ideology of getting rid of the public sector those ideology, uh, ideologists are very gleeful about this attack, and what that means is that there's something else going on here. The graphic, uh, I'll read it so not everyone can see it. If the, if the top 1% already own wealth equal to 90% of the rest of us, why do they need more wealth before they'll create any jobs? The situation is such that the potential to employ everyone in America exists, whether you look at the hoarded cash, or whether you look at the, meet the needs that everyone could be put to work doing. So we have to ask, answer that question in order to get beyond the band-aid. Now, I did note that if you take the pie chart on the next page, this graphic, the top 1% have uh, wealth equal to 90, is actually a little bit off the mark. It's more like 95%. So it's gotten worse maybe in the time between the creation of the graphic and the creation of the of the chart, which, of the pie chart, which was only 2007 statistics. Now, we're painting a picture of unemployment. I've been asked to make sure that it's really in your face, the graphic, the uh, numbers about this. One thing that's really circulating is the next, the graph. What you learn from this graph is that the Great Recession is lasting longer, was deeper and is lasting longer, than all of its predecessors since World War II. Something is going on here. If anyone has a question about how to read that, just think of the top on the left as zero, and zero uh, starting point, in other words, for a graph, is the number of jobs, it's different in each recession's case, but it's the number of jobs at the start, and the goal of the graph is to get back to zero, get back to the top line by the end of the recession. The recession by the economists is uh, the dip, not the ascension back up. The recession to you and me is getting back to normal. Turns out that you also have to wonder about what the jobs are going to be like because during this great shedding of jobs, there are jobs being shed that will never come back and the replacement jobs are pretty much at places like Walmart. So what I wanted to emphasize is that this is happening due to the activity of people and we are witnessing structural changes, which get to a point where it looks dramatically different to go through a recession. And the cartoon from Mike Kanapaki uh, says it all to me. The uh, zookeeper has been uh, trying to figure out why after a sign goes up saying, do not feed the worker, the economy is dying, at least the working class. 
So do not feed the worker might be the summing up, might be the bumper sticker for the ideology of the people we're talking about here who are running this economy in a different direction from the one that we want. Away from jobs, not for jobs. It's the governing paradigm, and even when we do something that looks like it benefits the working class, it's designed by and for the ruling plutocrats. That was the one minute mark, right? Thanks. That was, that was the... That was the five? Okay. So I'll leave you with the rest of the thought and just end with the last paragraph. The, the side trip into um, Obamacare is, uh, again, talking about how someone else is in charge of these reforms. And so that what we think is going to be necessary is to envision and win social, economic, and potential governing structures, structures that actually govern, make the decisions about society, that in fact feed the worker. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for, for, every, for everyone for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, and actually I, I would think on behalf of everyone, uh, I want to thank Representative McGovern and the entire Massachusetts delega congressional delegation for so valiantly uh, protecting, uh, the, to the best of their ability, uh, the SNAP program, other very vital programs. in the Farm Bill and beyond in our budget because without them, uh, we wouldn't have a chance and you know what, uh, I won't say it because we're in the house of God right now. Uh, but uh, we desperately need uh, their continued support uh, and we really are skirting with disaster. I mean, we almost experienced a $20 billion cut in the house if the Farm Bill had been passed, but thanks to our delegation and uh, 200 and some, close to 200 other uh, representatives, uh, it was defeated. Uh, we're still very, very concerned uh, about the Senate version of, this, of the Farm Bill, which did pass, and it passed with a cut to the SNAP program of $4.5 billion over 10 years. Uh, and that, what does that mean? Uh, if you translate that into meals, which is what we do uh, in the food bank, uh, that translates into uh, 1.6 billion meals over 10 years, or 160 meal, million meals every year. What does that mean? On average, what that means is that uh, the food bank of Western Massachusetts, uh, and every other food bank, there are about 204 across the country, would need to increase the amount of meals we distribute by 4 million every year. That's 50% of what we are currently distributing every year. That's almost an impossible task to expect uh, our food bank to do. Uh, certainly in the first year, to increase our distribution by 50 percent, four million meals. That's how many meals would be lost in our region alone if this Senate SNAP cuts go through in the Farm Bill, which has already passed. So it, is, it literally represents a tsunami of food insecure families across western Massachusetts that will turn to the Emergency Food Network composed of the food bank and 300 local feeding programs, some of which are represented right beside me, Community Action uh, and ServiceNet. Uh, it's unconscionable, uh, and we're really concerned about it. Uh, the food bank is, in many respects, a band-aid. We are not designed to solve or end hunger, certainly not on our own. We hope to work with our partners moving forward in the years ahead to come up with a plan to end hunger, but it's going to take all of us. It's going to take our federal legislators, our state legislators, the community, businesses, ourselves, and more. Until then, uh, we're going to do our job to try to prevent hunger at the moment, or food insecurity more broadly speaking. Those households who don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Who are they? A third are children. Another third are elders and people with disabilities. Right there, two-thirds of, of the food insecure individuals in our region and across the country for that matter are the most vulnerable citizens of our country. They do not have the means to take care of themselves. Another third are working families. Working families, an example, you know, if you have the luxury to have a full-time job, even making minimum wage, uh, two working adults with two kids, one preschooler, on minimum wage, combined income is $32,000. Yet we know in the Springfield metropolitan area, in order for that household to survive, they need to be earning $56,000. It's a $23,000 
hardship gap, thanks to analysis done by the Crittenden's Women Union in Boston. How does that gap get filled? It's supposed to get filled by government programs, whether it's housing subsidies, child care vouchers, things that uh, my colleagues will, will talk about. There's not enough funding for them. Uh, so that's why food banking comes into play. We, in many respects, are a, a hunger and, and, the, uh, and the issue that we face is very much a bellwether of struggling families and failing society. So clearly what we need is to go beyond the government programs and the charitable organizations that we have, and it does speak to uh, a fair labor market with fair wages, uh, not necessarily a free labor market with free wages, so to speak. Uh, so with that, I'll um, end for now. There are There is some information about the food bank in the back, or in the front, uh, that I, I invite you to take. Thank you. tonight. Um, I work for Shelter and Housing for ServiceNet, and we see at the shelters, we have a winter emergency shelter, the interface shelter that runs from November 1st till May 1st, and we also have the Grove Street Inn shelter, which is a more stabilized shelter, uh, just buys a little more time for people to uh, work on getting jobs or doing whatever they need to do, and with the hopes of getting housing at the end of everything. Um, we at least see close to 300, in just in last year alone, of homeless individuals who've come through uh, trying to get housing. Um, we have 21 beds at Grove Street, we have 20 at the Interface Shelter. We also have an extension uh, called the Annex that the Town of East Hampton has been graciously helping us with providing for our homeless individuals. They take six of our folks and they provide meals as well, all through volunteers. Uh, and with the help of the Amherst Shelter that's been operating for the last couple of years, it's been helpful for us to get people kind of inside and not having to turn folks away. We still do, unfortunately. We still don't have enough space. We, we don't have uh, the means to get people where they need to be immediately, but we definitely work with folks in trying to get them whatever it is that they need when they come through our doors. They need work. Um, a lot of our folks are without jobs, and it's been very difficult for them to find jobs. Uh, they are on food stamps, so they can try to get some food that way. We also have a group of volunteers, over 400 of volunteers to Friends of the Homeless, uh, who provide meals at these shelters to help people kind of continue on their path. Um, that's the gist of mine. That's about everything, I think. Questions for everybody? Thank you. So, um, each of these folks had a specific thing they were supposed to talk about, but I was supposed to talk about poverty. <laughs> it's all of this, plus. So let me talk for a minute about Community Action. Community Action was uh, grew out of the anti-poverty, the, 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 the anti-poverty movement of the 60s, the war on poverty, Lyndon Johnson decided, and I love that, that we had a president who said we can end poverty, right? We don't have those kind of presidents anymore. He had other problems, but he did say that. Um, and he put together, he and Sergeant Shriver put together uh, uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity, and one of the things they did was create this, these organizations called CAP agencies. CAP agencies, by their nature, they're supposed to be flexible organizations that can pull together people and programs to, to better the conditions for the, for the people living with low incomes in, in our community. So that's what we do. We serve 17,000 meals to young children a month, Poor children through our Head Start program, meals and snacks. We helped. Uh, um, I think, I think it was nine. It's, it's almost 10,000 households last year stay warm through uh, fuel systems. We help uh, along with the food banks and others, uh, food bank and others to help people get on SNAP benefits, and to uh, we run a, food, a couple food pantries. We do a whole bunch of that sort of services like that. But I want to go back to the beginning of our kind of agency. Our agency grew out of the idea that changing the society can make a difference in poverty. And now, the approach on poverty is, there's a problem with the poor person. That's a fundamental change in how we look at poverty. From the idea that if we could better the conditions of the community, people could live better lives, to you figure it out. It's your problem, it's your fault. That's where we are today. We assume that people who are poor are trying to get over 
Do you know what the average benefit, I know I can ask this question, and if nobody else answers Elizabeth Silverwell, what's the average benefit for a woman with one child living on, on TAFDC? Well, that's that. Somebody has something. 468, and that's with a subsidy, right? So if the difference is if you don't have a subsidy, you get four, a housing subsidy, you get $40 a month. You know, we, we, in, in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, we were creating housing that people could afford. Ronald Reagan started to begin the beginning of the end of that. We had programs like early childhood education that were growing. We had um, food stamps that was, was a, a safety net that was respected. You know, that grew out of the, that grew out of the fact, I think that was the Second World War, is that Congressman? And the goal, that before the Second World War, the goal was to help farmers sell their food. And the idea was, boy, we have hungry people. Shouldn't we help them get food? Now we want to put ID pictures on cards because we think people are trying to get over. So all of this stuff is true, and we have to change the way we approach this whole question. We have to change the way we do business, the way we think about poverty. We have to change the minimum wage. Two people on minimum wage making thirty-two thousand dollars a year. You think they can afford a house here? You think they can afford an apartment here? No. You know, in the North Balkan region, in Orange, the poverty people living in poverty doubled over the last eight years. Doubled. Fourteen percent of the people in the North the Balkan region are living in poverty. In Northampton, Amherst, East Hampton, Hampshire County went up three or four percent. Same for Franklin County in the North Balkan doubled because the jobs are gone. Those jobs went overseas, those, those jobs are gone. I want to make a, a, two more points. One is that we are being sold as bill of goods that if we just educate everybody, you know, there will be jobs for, you know, the problem is, it, again, the personal failure, not taking advantage of, advantage of education. I don't know about you, but we're always going to go to the grocery store and, and be buying uh, groceries. We're always, you know, I'm going to end up in a nursing pro home probably like many of you. That person is going to, we're going to still need that person. Maybe they're going to have a doctorate under this theory that we all have to get more education. But we have jobs that need to be done. And they're not necessarily high wage jobs. We have to figure out how to support those people so they can live in our community. We have to figure that out. I want to make one more point. I, I'm going to take the balance of her time like you're doing progress. <laughs> uh, I used to, I used to uh, run a daycare center in the basement of this church. And it was for teenage parents. They had a baby. They needed to figure out their lives. At that time, we could help them get a housing subsidy and get on, and, and get on to AFDC. We could provide them child care. We could provide them help as they moved into higher education. In the last six months, I've run into three of those folks. All of them are working. Two of them were the first person who ever graduated from high school in their family. And one of them had five children, didn't graduate from high school, but all of her kids graduated from high school. All of her kids. And four of them in college. Those programs actually work if you say we have to help you change the conditions of your life. And we have to change the conditions of society to support that. Thank you. David Enton uh, for inviting me here today. Let me let me thank the panelists, um, who you all know very well because of their, of their activism in this community uh, and in the, and throughout the state. Um, these people do um, unbelievable work, uh, and I admire them a great deal because they have decided to dedicate their lives to ending poverty. Uh, I wish there were more people like them, uh, quite frankly. So I am grateful to the panelists. And um, let me begin with a very troubling fact about life in America in 2013. So a family of four with two wage earners making the minimum wage still earn so little that they qualify for food stamps. So think about that for a minute. Two full-time workers cannot support their two children without help. So in many cases, SNAP is subsidizing an unfair minimum wage in this country. 
Um, you know, I wish I could tell you um, that things were like getting better in Washington. I wish I could tell you that, you know, something happened and everybody now finally figured out that uh, they were there to help make people's lives better and not make people's lives worse. Um, I wish I could tell you that we're enacting policies to get our country beyond the Band-Aid, um, but we're not. Uh, we're not. Uh, the best we can do right now uh, is to fight to protect the inadequate safety net that we already have from further attack. That was what this whole debate over the farm bill was about. Uh, you know, um, you know I, I, people ask me, uh, congratulations, you know, you, you brought down the farm bill and so SNAP doesn't get cut. And I feel, and I felt good for about, I feel good for about two seconds. And then I realized that what we should be debating is how we expand <laughs> these benefits, not how we take them away. So, in Washington today, we are not talking about a jobs bill, notwithstanding the fact that everywhere you go, people say that jobs is the most important issue. One might think that we might pass some bills that might you know, help stimulate certain sectors of our economy to produce more jobs and put more people back to work. I mean, after all, I think the best way to reduce the deficit is to put people back to work. Um, when Bill Clinton was president, we one, one of the biggest reasons why the deficit disappeared was because it was record economic growth, record economic growth during those years. So, jo there, you know, there is a correlation between jobs and deficit reduction. And quite frankly, I like the idea of deficit reduction by creating more jobs because we're actually helping people rather than kind of the policies that we're pursuing right now. There's no investment in infrastructure, none at all. And we have aging roads and bridges and sewer systems and water systems. We have aging energy systems. We ought to be in, in investing in new, clean, green energy as a way to kind of pave our future. Uh, and we're not doing any of that. Not doing any of that. Um, I, you may have read about that bridge that collapsed where a bunch of cars fell into a river. And I, I was in the rules committee saying, you know, this is how bad our infrastructure is. People driving over a bridge, the bridge collapses, they, they get thrown into the river. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And one of the, uh, one of the Republicans said, but nobody died. <laughs> no, nobody did die, thank God. Um, but they could have. And people do die every day in this country because of bad infrastructure. It's just a fact. Uh, we have a tax on student aid and, and the student loan program. Uh, on one hand, we say you know, we need a well-educated population to kind of be there ready for the jobs of the future. And then on the other hand, we're having a debate about whether or not to allow uh, interest rates on student loans to double. Uh, whether or not that we should continue uh, grant assistance. Should we restrict Pell Grants? Should we take resources away so the only people that can get a college education will be people who are well off? You know, a really stupid debate, but that's kind of what we're spending a lot of our energy on. We have this sequester, which represents an all-time high in recklessness and stupidity. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I voted against it when it, when it, when it, when it became, when it, you know, when it was, when it was passed. Said, but you know what? It is so stupid that it'll never happen. You know, and I just when I thought I couldn't be surprised anymore, it happened. It happened, across the board cuts in everything. So if you had a line item in the federal budget that was entitled fraud, waste, and abuse, abuse uh, you would treat medical research the same way. I've got, I've got uh, the uh, researchers at UMass uh, uh, Medical School in Worcester telling me that they're stopping uh, uh, research in, on important diseases because the NIH funding has been cut back as a result of sequester. Now, think of this. So, if we're going to kind of slow down the day we're going to find a cure to cancer and diabetes and Alzheimer's and, you know, what we're doing is we're prolonging human suffering. But what we're also doing is we're, uh, we're doing something that's not going to do anything to help us get our debt under control. If you could find a cure to Alzheimer's disease, Medicaid would never have another problem. Um, and so this notion that somehow that we should be cutting back on medical research, scientific research, you know, stuff that really is going to guarantee that our country is a future. I mean, we've always been the leaders in these areas. You know, I got researchers telling me that Singapore is trying to persuade them to go to that country because they will get a better deal, they will get all the lab space they want, they'll get all the money they want for their research because somebody in Singapore is saying, you know what, 
there's a future in this area. But we're, 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 we're cutting that right now. Um, and then there's another thing that I think is problematic, and that is um, the, the, the military budget and, and wars. And I, I, I got to... It, it, it's sucking up so many uh, important resources. You know, look at the plain truth is that the greatest, this is my opinion, so I, I probably shouldn't say the plain truth is, but my view is that the plain truth is uh, that the greatest danger to the American people um, really isn't a threat uh, from abroad, but it's the deterioration of our country from within. You know, um, we have become so obsessed uh, with the fear of terrorism uh, and have spent so much of our energy and resources to feed that fear that we have robbed and we have weakened our domestic society. Now, I, I, I want to protect this country um, and I want to do whatever we need to protect this country. But we are doing things that go far beyond what is necessary to protect the people of this country. Uh, and the price we're paying is kind of the deterioration of our country from within. You know, uh, everything from aging infrastructure to outright poverty. Uh, and, um, and so we, we need to start talking a little bit more openly and, um, and be a little bit more fearless uh, in kind of taking on some of these assumptions that have kind of captured Washington right now where, you know, there's the, nothing could be, when the, right now when the Pentagon submits their budget, Congress gives them more than they asked for. I mean, I don't, I don't ever think that the Joint Chiefs of Staff, staff are, are shy. You know, I don't think that the people over, the generals over there, you know, would hesitate to tell us what they need. So they give us a, what they want and we say, you, need, you, you get that and we'll give you some more too. Um, that's how kind of out of control things are. Uh, and, um, and this war on, on terrorism, you know, we need to have a, we need to have a talk about whether or not it's worth all the resources we're putting into it. I mean, are we getting what we want in return? Um, and I'm going to tell you, I, I, you know, this has been the case for a long time. Uh, we need to kind of have a discussion about what our priorities are. And you can have a tough but lean military. You can have an effective and smart anti-terrorism program that doesn't suck all the resources um, out, of our, out of our federal budget. Let me just focus a little bit because the farm bill came up on the issue of hunger. And Andrew talked about it very eloquently, but let me just kind of give you a few more little figures here. There were 50 million people in the United States of America who were hungry. 50 million, 70 million are kids. We're the richest, most powerful nation in the world. We have 50 million people who are hungry. Uh, there is no community, not even Beverly Hills, that is hunger free. There's no congressional district in this country that is hunger free. I was, as I reminded my colleagues last week, food is not a luxury, it's a necessity. You know, you need food to live. I mean, it's that simple. So when we're talking about, you know, whether we provide people the benefit to get food, it is not about being nice to them, it is about giving them a necessity. Over, um, we, we are, we're told that by a number of studies, the most recent one by the Center for American Progress, that there's a cost to hunger, not just the human you know, cost, the suffering of individuals, um, but there's a financial cost. Over a hundred billion dollars a year for the cost of hunger. Avoidable health care costs. I sat in at Boston Medical Center with this incredible pediatrician, Dr. Deb Franks, who told me about the children that come into her emergency room who really have nothing more than a common cold, but because their immune systems are so compromised because they haven't eaten, that they have a, now a severe infection which requires multiple days in the hospital. You, I met a, at the emergency room in Worcester at UMass um, um, uh, Medical Center. Senior citizens coming in, taking their medication on an empty stomach because they can't afford food and medicine. It's one or the other. And they end up for prolonged stays. There's a tie between hunger and obesity, food insecurity and obesity. Parents who don't have access uh, to, um, to nutritious foods tend to buy stuff that's, that, quite frankly, is empty calories. You know, there's a cost to that. Diabetes, high blood pressure. Then there's kids who go, who go to school hungry. I tell, I tell people all the time, just as a, a, a meal is just as important as a textbook in order for that child to learn. You go to school hungry, you, don't, you can't focus. Doesn't matter how 
much equipment you have. Doesn't matter how great your textbooks are. Doesn't matter how wonderful your teacher is. If that child is not fed in the morning, that child will probably not be able to learn very much that day. And if that child is not fed on a regular basis, that child will, not, will never learn. And there's a cost to that as well. You know, I have, um, you know, the food banks, I mean, as Andrew will tell you, and others will tell you, this, this, this stretch to capacity. So when I hear people say, well, you know what, government can cut back and the charities will pick up. These guys are already providing food to people who work. That's how bad things are. I mean, that's how stretched the resources are all over this country. And because of sequestration, there are food banks that are being shut down all around the country. So when Congress decided to fix sequestration be, for, you know, because there were, uh, airline flights were being delayed, it was really kind of curious that they decided to fix it the, uh, the, the two days before we were about to go off on a week-long recess. But there were all these different flight delays, and then we, the Senate unanimously passed a bill to fix it for, you know, uh, for, for the airlines, and then the House of Representatives followed. Forty-one of us voted no. I voted no. Not because I like not because I like delays in airlines, but because I don't know how you can sit with a clear conscience and say I you know I'm fixing this so I don't get, get delayed on my airline tomorrow. But there are food banks that are being closed. I should tell you though that uh, the next day I did fly from Washington to Boston. My plane was 20 minutes early. So, um, <laughs> but but it, it, but it, it I think what it shows is how kind of out of sync our priorities are in Washington. Um, I, I just, I mean, really, when you think about it, of all the things to fix first, of all the things, I mean, you know, I, 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 the Head Start offices are being shut down all throughout the state because of the cutbacks that are already in place. I mean, I, I go right down the list, and the people who get disproportionately impacted are poor people. Now, I am, um, I, SNAP is just one tool in the toolbox to end hunger. You know, food banks, you know, the, these housing programs, all the stuff, we're, all, every, these, are, these are tools. In and of themselves, they're not the answer to ending poverty. They can help, but they can't do it alone. They can't do it alone. And, um, I, you know, I've asked the president, I've been asking him now for, you know, five years, they ought to do a White House conference on food and nutrition and bring everybody together. You know, bring everybody here, you know, we'll bring these, this panel, I mean, whoever wants to come, you know, um, all the governmental agencies, because by the way, all these anti-poverty programs, they don't all fall under one agency or one department. So you got HUD, you got the Department of Agriculture, you got HHS, I mean, you got all these different, and you know what? What happens is they don't, sit, they don't gather all the time and talk about how to coordinate. And so we have some good programs, where the dots aren't connected. They need to be connected. So you need all the governmental agencies in there. We need to figure out what the state is gonna do. We need to figure out what local communities are gonna do. We need to figure out what uh, philanthropists are gonna do and businesses, where our schools fit in, what our hospitals need to do, right down the hole. But everybody should be put in a room, the door should be locked, and, and the deal is this. You're not leaving until you have a plan because you cannot solve hunger, you cannot solve poverty, you cannot solve anything without a plan. And in this country, we do not have a plan. If the President of the United States were right up here right now, and you said, what is your plan to end hunger? Uh, well, he might say, well, you know, we, 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 I, you know, I support the SNAP program, I support this. But that, though, you're supporting programs. You do not have a plan to end hunger. If we did all these things, this would end hunger. And by ending hunger, by the way, you are, you are also talking about how do you end poverty. And you, know, you, you need, if without a plan, then you can't hold people accountable. Without a plan, you don't know you can't, you don't have benchmarks. You don't know whether you're making it. It's, it's, you know, like I say, Hillary says it takes a village. She's right. It takes a plan, too. We need a plan. And the White House, we need White House leadership on this. And I know the president is with us in his heart. The president, to his credit, issued a veto threat on that god-awful bill that came out of the House, the, the farm bill. And the president, to his credit, in his budget, does not uh, cut the SNAP program. Um, but we need them to kind of take on some bolder leadership here. Uh, and that's what one of, the, one, of the things, one of the things that we're hoping for. Now, I lived on a SNAP budget, um, a SNAP diet, food stamp diet, for the last, uh, for a week. I ended it uh, the, the, the day after the Farm Bill uh, went down. 
And we did it because I wanted my colleagues to understand what we're talking about. The average food stamp benefit um, is $1.50 a meal, $4.50 a day. Okay? So when people think that it's this unbelievably generous, over-the-top benefit, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And so we, you know, 20 of us lived on this food stamp budget, and I had to be careful because I had to buy food that I could take on an airplane with me. You know, like I, I couldn't take peanut butter because that would be confiscated. So I had to, I had to really plan. But the things that, the things that you, you realize is that it's hard to be poor. It's just a lot of work and a lot of worry. I've got two kids, and if I, had to, if I had to worry every day about whether or not I had food to put on their table, I'd go out of my mind. I'd go, to, I'd go crazy. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I mean, no parent should have to deal with that. But yet, there are millions of people in this country that do. So, you know, you don't have, you can't afford fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, and, and you know, and we, and we need to, you know, figure out a way to make sure that not only people have enough to eat, but people have access to nutritious food. Because, and you know, and that was one of the missing uh, debates in the healthcare, uh, Affordable Health Care Act. We didn't, we didn't talk about nutrition. Uh, but yet nutrition is very much connected to health. Food is medicine. My grandmother used to say to me, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Drove me nuts. You know, I wish she was still alive, but tell her she was right. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, we need, to, we, need to have that, we need to have that discussion. So, you know, I want a farm bill. We need a farm bill. Our small farmers and our medium-sized farmers, they need some certainty. We need to figure out a way to get a farm bill. Um, the trouble with this farm bill um, is that it made hunger worse in America, and that's too high a price to pay. And uh, the trouble with this farm bill, and I know you have to do some give and take to get what you want, but uh, sushi rice farmers got a really sweet deal. If you grew sushi rice, uh, you, you hit the jackpot. Um, I want poor people to be treated at least as well as sushi rice. Um, and in this farm bill, it wasn't even close. Uh, all these special interests, um, you know, these, these crops that quite frankly do not need any more government subsidies were getting, uh, you know, were hitting payday. You know, and what made matters worse, in addition to the $20.5 billion cut, which would have thrown 2 million people off the benefit, over 200,000 kids would lose their free breakfast and lunch at school, was that that wasn't enough for some. They, had a, they, wanted to, they, they wanted to add on onerous work requirements, notwithstanding the fact that we're cutting work training programs. And then the drug testing amendment was a lot of fun. I got up and I said, you know, you want, to, you want to drug test everybody who's on SNAP? How about we drug test everybody who's the beneficiary of crop insurance or, every, or everybody who gets a, a, a big subsidy uh, as part of this farm? But why don't, we why don't we drug test them people? You know, and, you know, and, and while we're at it, let's, let's let, why, why everybody in Congress, you know, go in the back room, urinate in a cup, let's see whether you're on drugs, and, you know, may, and maybe you are. That might explain why we're having this debate, you know, on making people's lives more miserable in this country. Um, and it was amendment after amendment after, if you were, if you were ever, they had an amendment, if you ever were convicted of a felony, you never, you were ineligible for the rest of your life to get SNAP, even if you had served your time. And they come and say, this is about rapists and pedophiles and, and, and murderers. You know what? Um, when people ser serve their time, you know, and if they're, what, what about their kids? What about their families? I mean, you know, I guess it's a great soundbite, and nobody wants to vote against that because it's hard to explain in a political campaign. But think about what we're doing. It's like a race to the bottom. Um, and, you know, um, you know we, ought to, we, we ought to be thinking about nation building here at home. Um, because our country, our, I'll tell you, I mean, you know, I, I'm impressed with the, the, the uh, the, the feeding program out in the front here and, and, uh, and all the great things that people in this community are doing, quite frankly, all throughout the country, people are doing good things. But we can be so much better. We can be so much better. And, uh, you know, um, so I'll, I'll just kind of conclude with this. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Gandhi, it, is, is the difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. And, you know, and so we're capable of doing much, much more than we're doing. Um, and we need to try to change the discussion. And here's, here's kind of where every, I think we all kind of, we all fit in uh, right now. Look, the extreme right wing 
um, want to wear you down. They want to wear me down. They want to wear all of you down. They want you to be. They want. They want you to feel so kind of just sick and tired of fighting that uh, you give up. That you walk away. That's how they're going to win. They, they're in this for the long haul. They're going to keep on going after these things, these programs, and these people, and targeting and demonizing poor people and diminishing their plight. You know, and not talking about poverty, not talking about solving big problems. They're going to keep on doing that and chipping away at this stuff just to wear us all down. That's the plan. I'm going to tell you, it is tiring, you know, and I, and, I, and, I, and I sat there for hours and hours and hours on the House floor debating this thing, and I'm like, God, you know, I, I want to like bang my head up against a cement wall because sometimes it's just so frustrating. But if we walk away from this, we don't push back, they win. They win, and it is that, it is that, it is that simple. I mean, we need, we, you know, Claire talked about, you know, the, Lyndon Johnson. We, we do, we need a war on poverty. We need the President of the United States to say we're gonna have a war on poverty in this country and figure out how to, and figure out how to proceed. You know, we need to think big. We, we can solve big problems. You know, one of the maddening things about hunger and about poverty is that it's solvable. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not like, I mean, I wish I could figure out how you can end all wars forever and ever and ever, or make it so that nobody, uh, you know, uh, was, you know, was prejudiced against anybody else. I wish I could eliminate all hate in the world. I, I don't have the answer to that on, the, on my fingertips. But these things, these are all solvable. You know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to do anything. We, we, we know what to do. So that's what drives me crazy about this stuff is that it is solvable. And, um, and so I, I come here tonight really grateful that this is a community that takes the citizenship seriously, that this is a community that cares about your neighbors and about the country and about the world. Uh, and. Um, and, I, uh, and I, I have to tell you, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to say a few words on, on this subject because we need to have discussions like the ones we're having here in Washington. And if we can't you know, get Speaker Boehner or the White House or whoever uh, to start focusing on these issues, then we're going to have to all get in a bus and go down and sit in front of their office um, and press this issue. You know? What's going on in Washington, there ought to be millions of people protesting uh, on the mall. There ought to be. You know, I, I, I look out my window every day uh, and, uh, you know, and I'm listening. I'm hoping, you know, that there'll be this great march on Washington to, uh, to kind of take back this country. We need to do that. I mean, we need to fight. This is a time to fight. So anyway, I appreciate that opportunity to be here and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for our panel. If you'd like to stay and ask a few questions, I see some of you have cards. Uh, some of our church members will come and you can hand them to the edge of the aisles and I'll take a couple of minutes to sort through and uh, get some of the questions from all of you. Um, let me just, while we're getting the cards, I'll ask a couple of things that are quickly answerable. Those of you who are working with local organizations here, would you say you all probably faced cutbacks or at least indirectly been affected by cutbacks. How's your volunteer pool? Have you found that people have stepped up and, and done a lot to try to meet the need? Is it more or less than before? Yeah. Is, or you can shake your heads yes. I'll speak to that. Um, at the food bank, uh, we're actually fortunate that we've not experienced uh, cuts. Uh, and that's in part because we don't rely that much on state and federal funding. Uh, we rely on the generosity of businesses and individuals. Uh, but unfortunately, we are experiencing just more and more demand for emergency food. So we need to increase funding to be able to keep up with the, the demand. In fact, we expect to distribute two million more meals over the uh, next couple of years uh, than we are now. And as it is now, we're distributing the equivalent of six million meals every year to more than 135,000 people in Western Massachusetts. That's one in eight people. So we very much rely 
a more financial support and volunteer support. We have a very vol robust volunteer program and we invite anyone and everyone to come and learn about the food bank. We have orientations twice a month in the evening and on weekends uh, and we will put you to work and if we can't put you to work, we can connect you with a local pantry or meal site in any community in the four counties of Western Massachusetts so that you can not only help us, but you can listen and learn about the, the struggles that people are facing and, and that is just as uh, important to us as anything else you could do. Can I just take Thanks. a... Sure. It's, we are seeing more volunteers and that's really important and people are stepping up and we're seeing more contributions, but we have to pay for some of this stuff. Like, I can't staff Head Start classrooms with volunteers. I just can't. I, I, if I don't have less money, I can't I can't run kitchens with volunteer cooks. They have to be serve safe trained. They have to be. They have to manage that kitchen. So there's there's things that we can do with volunteers, and we're grateful for every single volunteer. But I'm just having a little echo of Ronald Reagan when he vetoed childcare money, saying they could be taken care of by grandmothers in church basements. And I want us. I was in the church basement, but I wasn't a grandmother at the time. But, but I, I, you know, I don't want us to don't get. I don't want to get caught up in this idea. Right. In, even inadvertently, yeah. that we can fill a gap right. that is so huge. You know, we can work around the edges, and more people are stepping up, and I'm Absolutely. really grateful. Yep. But there is a big gap. Yep. yep. And, and I just want to say why I asked that. How many of you volunteer with some local nonprofit? Raise your hands. It's not everybody in the room. And I think that's exactly the point is here you are. You're all working out there. How many of you volunteer more now than you did five years ago? Yeah. Okay. How many of you have written your congressional representative? <laughs> About the same. Pretty good. How many of you have been on the bus to go to Washington? Not bad. This is a pretty active group. And, you know, there's a ton of questions here, and there's a huge theme just in a quick glance through them. Everybody wants to know, what do we do? Um, and and here's, here's a good example that I'll throw out there for you to look at. Uh, how do we as citizens, voters, um, you know, we've already got some great congressional representatives with Representative McGovern, we've got Elizabeth Warren, um, we'll have a new senator on Tuesday. <laughs> so we're doing great here in Massachusetts, but how do we shift the discussion from just, you know, how do we, how do we shift the discussion? How do we create, you know, we've done this far, but what, what do we do to move the discussion on a wider scale? Because I think, I think as Claire said, we're tired, right? Can I, yeah. Yeah. Can I just say one other thing? There's a front page story in the Globe today. How many of you people, how many people here get the Globe? Okay, so, and the, it's, the title is Broken City, right? They had this series of articles about how Congress is broken. Huge issue is this redistricting piece where even though a majority of the country last year voted to fill his House of, the House of Representatives with Democrats, not Republicans, the Republicans have the majority. Massachusetts, I, we did a good job in our redistricting, but we should be a leader in um, nonpartisan redistricting. We, we, should, we should take a lead there. We should start tipping the, the, the um, we should start trying to tip the balance there so that more parts of the country are doing nonpartisan redistricting. You know, we're, oh, we're going to get Democrats in there really how we slice the pie, mostly. Let's take a lead there and let's try to start that happening in the rest of the country because otherwise, the, the Republicans have like a, a plan to have this happen for the next couple censuses. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be a majority of Democratic countries with a majority of Republican Congress. We have to do something about that. And we should take the lead right here in terms of nonpartisan redistricting. The other thing, too, is I would suggest that you all get behind this effort to try to uh, get at this issue of money and politics, Absolutely. corporations, our people, you know, because I'm, I'm not going to there's too much, some, some of the priorities are being so almost exclusively by, by money. The, the other thing is, um, you know, uh, I had a, I was at an event a couple weeks ago and somebody said, oh, I feel pressure, I live in Massachusetts because you all vote the right way, we're most, you know, what do we do? I said, well, first of all, that's a good, that's a reflection on you that we vote the right way. But secondly, um, I suggest that we all can do more. I can do more. Every one of us in the delegation can do more. We can, we can lead 
better, we can sneak out more. We can, I mean, there, there, are, there are more things that we can do. I mean, I know it doesn't sound right for me to say that, but, you know, that you should tell me to do more. But the point of the matter is, it does help when people are weighing in, even with the people that you think are going to be okay, because it provides a little bit of wind at their back, so you don't feel so lonely, so you don't feel like, geez, does anyone really care about this? So, uh, you know, just because we vote the right way here doesn't mean we shouldn't be called or emailed or visited, you know, or urged to do more. Um, so don't tell anybody else in the delegation I said that, but I'm just <laughs> telling you who's amongst us here. Well, one of the problems with having campaign finance reform is that uh, the Supreme Court deems a lot of what we need to do is unconstitutional. So there is a move. I have a couple of amendments to that would amend the Constitution. I don't like the idea, but I mean, if you, if the only way to get around that is get a Supreme Court that will vote with you, or you have to amend the Constitution. But honestly, it's, that's, a, that's a long term process. In the short term, the one thing you can do that is within the Constitution is at a minimum call for full disclosure. So, like, you know, when I do an ad, a political ad, I say paid for by Jim McGovern. Now, if um, Chevron, you know, wanted to, to invest $20 million against me in a race, um, they could do an ad against me, and it, it could say paid for by friends who love the environment and little babies and apple pie. <laughs> and you have no access to the truth as to who's, who's doing it. So, we ought to, we, we, and we ought to be asking people who give to these super PACs also have to, have to file their name. We ought to know who's giving to these super PACs. We ought to know if the oil companies are, you know, where the big agribusinesses are, or whoever. There, there needs to be more transparency. We can't limit, and let's open it up so that people know who the hell's getting involved in these campaigns. And um, so that's something we can do right away. So there's a, there's a, there are efforts to try to push for more disclosure. Unfortunately, with the makeup of the House of Representatives, chances of getting to the floor are very difficult right now. And, and in the Senate, um, what I would also urge in the Senate to change your rules. You know, change your rules. And then, because the notion that you need 60 or 70 people to have lunch is, is insane. The majority rules. That's, what, that's the way our democracy is supposed to be. Yeah. So, anyway. I have about six questions here that are all about tax reform, and, and really two issues. One is uh, corporate tax reform. Uh, uh, how can we have a more fair system in corporate taxes? And also, uh, certainly property taxes are on a lot of people's minds here in Northampton as we face an override vote. And several questions uh, note that uh, the property tax is the main source here locally seems unfair, uh, and how can we deal with some of these major uh, tax issues? Um, and that looks like a question. Yeah, I you guys may have Do you all want to? I can talk about the property tax. Yeah. Okay. And then you can take on. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and I, this, I think we might agree on this. We have a 17th century tax system and local government for a 21st century society. We, you know, it used to be that the tax assessor went out and counted your cows and figured out how many acres you had and that's what you pay, right? And at the time, that was the representation of wealth. Now we have this system that really is built on that 17th century model. But Massachusetts, you're constitutionally prohibited from having a graduated income tax. Um, so that's not gonna happen unless we all pull together and try to change that. And Massachusetts, um, because we have a ballot system, a ballot question system, and Proposition 2 and a half passed on the ballot, and other things have passed on the ballot, the legislature is reluctant to do very much at all in terms of progressive tax reform. There is a, 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 a bill in front of the legislature called, um, I'm going to forget what it's called, it's put together by the Progressive Caucus that puts together a number of tax uh, issues to try to move us in a more progressive direction. You can do that even with a flat income tax by increasing the deductions, by, by giving better deductions even for property tax and increasing the, um, the um, uh, um, I'm not going to say this right, but the tax um, offsets for people who are low income or, or elderly, which we don't really do now in our property tax. There are ways to do it, we're not doing them. 
But, and so what happens on the local level is you have a very divisive property, you have very divisive ballot questions where people are feeling very, very uh, upset. But, the, you know, this is a really a pet peeve of mine where the, the local government is really the government right now where you get most of what you get. You know, it, That's right. it, most of what you get every day, if you turn on your water, thank local government. You know, if you, <laughs> if you have to toilet flushes, thank local government. You know, I mean, those things are coming from the local level. And uh, the local level has been starved over the last 30 years for, for help, especially from the federal government and also from the state government. Um, so, you know, I, I, this is an, an override debate, but I will say that we have, uh, that we have a, uh, we, we had something called the social contract, right? The, that we have an obligation to those people who come the next in, in, in line, and, we, and the people who raised us have an obligation to us. And part of that obligation is education. And the place in the United States that education gets paid for is on the local level. And it's paid for by property taxes. The federal government really is an absent partner in the payment of property taxes. In Massachusetts, the state pays less as a percentage of the total than a number of other states. So none of us like it. But I'm referring to the nursing home again. I want, I want the nurse who's reading the dosage of my medication to be able to read it. I, <laughs> I want the doctor to be literate and numerate, right? So those things are important. Well, I mean, two things. One, we ought to have a, 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 a national civics class on government uh, so that everybody can understand what government is and what government is. And, you know, what, I mean, I, 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 was in a, I was in a new part of my district and uh, uh, I met at a lunch with a bunch of business people and I can tell that, you know how you can tell when somebody doesn't, you know, they don't really like you, they're walking, they're like, I said, oh, there he is, you know, so. I knew I was in for a little bit of a rough time. So I went around asking, well, what can I do for this small town that I was in? And um, this guy said, well, I'll begin. And he went through a list of, you know, I need, we need a public safety uh, facility. We need, uh, we need some open space for some playing fields for our kids. This bridge over this river doesn't, is, it needs repairing. You know, went down for that heavy list. The fire department needs this, the schools need this. And then he, I said, I kind of just said, um, oh, Jim, one more thing, and we need an open pass on 146, which would probably cost $100 million. I mean, the right, way what are you talking about? And so I kind of jokingly, sarcastically said, anything else? And he says, yeah. He says, I'd like to get government off my back. <laughs> and, and so and I, I looked at him, and I said, well, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm not a politician. I said, well, I am. And I'm trying to represent you. So you tell me what it is that the federal government is doing right now. Jesus, taxes. I said, well, I'm not saying the fact that we've been cutting taxes on the federal level consistently um, at great cost to our country, I should add. Um, you just ticked off from me about $300 million worth of projects. Who the hell do you think is going to pay for that? I mean, you know, some other community is going to just pitch in so that your community can get what you want. I think people do not, I think we need, I think there are a lot of people in this country who do not understand what government is. They don't understand it's their police, their fire, their teachers, their, uh, you know, their, uh, you know, the people who protect the quality of their water. I mean, um, their, their Medicare, their Medicaid, I mean, all those things. So, one, we need to have that discussion. The second thing on taxes, uh, you know, look, I, I'm not, I don't believe that the way you're going to solve this is, you know, just simply by, you know, hitting, you know, telling corporations you're going to pay ten times more, you know, in terms of their, in terms of what their corporate tax rate is. Uh, they can pay, they can pay more than they're paying, I think. Uh, but here's the deal: I, 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 I met with a group of corporate leaders who said, "Oh, you're always so anti corporation." I'm, no, 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 I'm not. You know, I'm not willing to give you a generous, you know, um, tax rate. But in exchange, what I want is an elimination of all loopholes. Because that is where, that is where we're all losing. So, you, you know, you may have a tax rate at X amount, but then you get these corporations to pay no taxes. You know, they're not even paying what they're supposed to. They're paying all these little deductions, these loopholes that you could, you know, open up a P.O. box in Bermuda, or, you know, and not have, and, 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 and uh, not be, have to pay federal taxes. All these kinds of things. So it's the loopholes, it's these little sweetheart deals 
that all need to be eliminated. You eliminate all of that, and we will have a lot more money to be able to give to states and communities to deal with infrastructure, schools, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but I, but I, I'll just end it as I begin here. You know, listen, Claire says, we, the, look, the, there are certain things that need to get done, and without government, they won't get done. And we got to support those those uh, those those things. And uh, and I think we got to remind our fellow citizens that when they get up and they say, you know, oh, I'm sick of government, cut government. Cut. What do you remember? What you're cutting? Remember what you're going after? You're lowering your standard of life. And that's what we've been doing consistently. That's what we're having this discussion here today. Because we've been cutting, 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 cutting. And you know, and what we have is more poor people, more hungry people. More people who can't do good housing, you know, you know, more workers who can't get a job. I mean, so you know, we gotta we gotta we gotta get this right. So uh, some of you have participated in the campaign for our communities, some of you may know about it, that the uh, coalition of labor and community organizations at the state level produced a reform to the income tax that would turn it in somewhat a progressive manner by increasing the exemptions. Increasing the tax and increasing the exemptions. The rich would pay more above a certain level, something like uh, $67,000 a year. People would start to pay a little bit more, but ultimately the people with the six figures would be hit the most, and it would look like Massachusetts had a progressive income tax. Uh, Claire alluded to the fact that that's unconstitutional, so we have to have an end run around the Constitution because uh, some of you, again, participated in the attempt to reform, to change the Constitution, to allow progressive income tax, and that was defeated at the ballot box. Then came the governor's proposal, which in some cases was even more progressive. It was very similar, again, raise the tax and raise the uh, exemption. Then came the resolution of this <laughs> contradiction between two proposals. What was it? It was um, put more money into mass transit and forget about the rest. That's our legislature. And raise the gas tax. Uh, yes. There were taxes, other taxes that were regressive, that go into fulfilling this ultimate legislative solution. And what happened? On the one hand, the coalition that created the campaign for our community still exists. It's going to be ongoing. You should Google it. You should get involved in it. On the other hand, the solution of the legislature is a reflection on the people that we put there, Democrats and Republicans alike, and have bought into an idea that Massachusetts is not ready for a tax increase. But it wouldn't be a tax increase on the majority of Massachusetts. So what do they actually say? It's not in their personal interest. It's in their personal interest to uh, say Congress wants to be able to fly without any hassle. I think what we have to do is follow the money and talk about who is deciding these things and haven't we evolved into a status of having a ruling oligarchy deciding our laws and not a democracy. And the people who try to fight back against this, who we send, especially from Massachusetts, we send into Congress to change the legislation. They're going up against legislation that's already been written. They going up against a steamroller that started with the, what I call the Reagan Revolution. So we're not going to solve the tax problem directly because the symptom of the class interests of the people in Congress as a whole, especially the Millionaires Club over in the Senate. And we work our family off in Massachusetts and we're gonna send, on Tuesday, we're gonna now have two very progressive senators and they're gonna be spitting in the wind unless something is done about the structural thing that the Senate is now today. So we all know we're here. We all get the big picture. We all, as Claire said, really what she was supposed to speak about is the entire a subject. What I would like to emphasize is that it's decision makers about the economy, especially the ones we can control, but also the ones that are hidden and behind the corporate desks. It's those decision makers that have to be replaced. Our, our panel has done an excellent job of telling us what's happening, uh, giving us ideas. Uh, they often probably made all of us feel angry and frustrated as well. 
And uh, we obviously won't get all the great questions that we have here tonight. But to wrap up, I wonder if any of you would like to say, what right now gives you the most hope? What things are happening? Where, what's on the horizon that really gives you hope that we can make a difference? Would any of you like to uh, grab onto that? Strikes by McDonald's workers, Walmart workers, eventually Lowe's, J.C. Penney's, you know, all those consumer goods are being <coughs> represented to us in the stores by workers who are uh, trodden on every day. And if they get off their fanny, maybe the rest of us will too. Right? There's been talk for many years about increasing the minimum wage. Uh, I, I do sense that there is going to be some action, if not at the federal level, uh, at the state level. Uh, and we have to be able to reward work Otherwise, people are going to be in the situation that they're in right now. A perfect example is, uh, and this is part of the problem and why we need a plan, is that you could be working full time uh, and a household could be earning $44,000 a year, well above a minimum wage, and yet you're ineligible for food stamps, SNAP. Because again, you, know, you could be earning $45,000 but you need to be making $56,000 just to scrape by. So what do those folks do who are working so hard? That's why I'm speaking as, on behalf of myself as an individual. Uh, I'm hopeful that, we'll, that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will increase the minimum wage to offset this, the onerous um, welfare reform that, uh, that it's about to be passed uh, that uh, looks like it's going to invest money in train job training and, and offer extended uh, child care vouchers, but you know that's only one side of the picture. Uh, you've got to reward work so that people uh, can succeed. Um, I agree, and then also just having this here, what's happening today, so that we can continue to talk and, and continue to have more people involved. Um, it definitely takes I don't know, the village, the whole town, but we definitely need this to continue and not to give up on it. Um, in terms of housing, you know, it's, when we talk about hope, I'm hopeful for anything to happen uh, because we don't have anything at this point. We're really struggling with what we have, which is not much. Just last year we housed 17 people, 17 individuals that were homeless. That's not a lot. Not when you're seeing close to 300. So this right here is hope enough for me. Thanks. I forgot to mention, uh, what it really is hopeful to me is that not only will the Commonwealth, and I believe will, increase the minimum wage, but I, I think there's, we're at a point where they will index it to inflation. That's, that's got to happen. <laughs> so, um, I'm not particularly hopeful since I've been presiding over sequester cuts at our agency and we'll be looking at more of those. So that's been very difficult. Um, but you know what's made, made me hopeful? Have you followed what's going on in North Carolina and the State House around the vote? That, and I'm, I'm, what I'm excited about is these states that we don't think maybe are simpatico with Massachusetts where people are saying, wait a minute, enough is enough. And so North Carolina is one of those. Because I think the fight really to take back Congress does have to happen on the state level. I think it really does have to happen in state houses. And, and the, you know, it, Congress, is as the, as the, as our great congressman said, he's representing the people who sent him there, right? But in a lot of other states, people aren't getting to send the people they need to there. That reform has to happen on the state level. You know, when, again, when half the, over half the country voted for Democrats, and we have John Boehner as the speaker, it tells you that the reform has to happen. So I'm hopeful about North Carolina. Just a note though, that, uh, uh, again, back to welfare reform for a minute. The same day the, Bo the Boston Globe had a story about this welfare reform where people are going to get child care vouchers and they're going to get all this other stuff. Well, first of all, we're closing daycare centers, we're not opening them. But that being aside, above the fold was a story by the guy that unemployed the two years, who was a professional HR director of a major corporation. Why do we think really poor people are going to be any more successful than he was getting jobs? It just right. makes me nuts. When the fire bill went down, uh, a reporter asked me uh, on my way out the floor, um, what's the lesson? And I said, the lesson 
lesson to the Republican, to Speaker Boehner, is that um, uh, if you screw poor people, you're not going to get a lot of Democratic votes. And um, and I, I and I think that's I, I was very very encouraged that in, in large part because people like you all across this country weighed in on this debate that you actually helped shape the opinions of a lot of members of Congress whose intention was to vote for the farm bill, no matter what was said, no matter what, no matter how deep the cuts were in SNAP, they had a subsidy or this industry and the special, whatever, whatever that was taken care of in the farm bill. And almost all the Democrats um, voted no. Um, and that would not have happened naturally. Uh, it happened because they were pushed, because they were pushed. And so I was hopeful because you know, sometimes you get through these people, you know, and 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 you know, and make it and, and make a difference. The other thing was hopeful a couple of weeks ago during the defense authorization bill. A lot of you guys were helpful with this. I offered my usual amendment to you know, try to get us the hell out of the war in Afghanistan, and we um, and this was a, 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 an amendment that basically said, the President said we're out by the end of 2014. Um, we, we we supported ending this war. Um, if he can accelerate it, we want him to accelerate the withdrawal. But if he decides that he's going to stay beyond uh, December of 2014, for whatever reason, then in June of next year, of 2014, Congress ought to go to either authorize it or not authorize it. And that passed overwhelmingly. That okay. passed overwhelmingly. And that can happen by action. Uh, so, you know, there, there, there are these glimmers that, you know, where I, I kind of feel like if we push things will happen. It shouldn't be this hard. It shouldn't be this difficult. In a perfect world, this all should be easy and everybody should figure this out on their own. But we're not dealing uh, with a perfect world right, right now. And, you know, and we really, I guess my, my, my me message here is we, we can't get tired. We cannot get tired. You know, I don't know, do you ever remember the guy named I.F. Stone? Absolutely. I have stuck around. So I get I met I have right before he died. I mean, I think it was his 90s. And I think Reagan was president at the time. And, um, and I was in age work for Joe Mowgli, and I remember saying to him, you know, geez, oh, God. <laughs> you know, everything's falling apart here. And he, and, uh, he said, don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. He said, I have a philosophy. He says, if you, if you pee on a stone long enough, to make an indentation. <laughs> uh, and That's I, I think about those wise, sage words from this incredible man. And he's right. You know, um, you, know you can. I mean, if, 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 we, if we fight back, you know, push. And, you know, and, you know, and I may not, you may not always agree with me on everything I do, and, you know, and I, and, I, and I have no doubt that the people in the Saudis won't be shy, don't even know. Um, <laughs> But you know, we, we, we need to push back, we need to push back. Um, let me just leave you with this. Uh, somebody at, at an event a couple of days ago said to me, oh, you talk about hunger, It'll, you know, we always had hunger. It'll never get better in this country. There's nothing we can do. And I remind them that there was a man named George McGovern and Robert Dole, a liberal Democrat, a conservative Republican, who, who, who fought hard for food stamps, uh, WIC, um, you know, school feeding program, on and on and on. In the 1970s, statistically, we were we were making strides toward ending hunger in, in this country. We were going in that direction. We were, we were actually doing it. And then Reagan became president, and then everything went to hell. But the point of the matter is, this is all doable, and we've got examples to show that it can, it can happen. So, anyway, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I'm hopeful because they're all fighting for good fight. If you stand up and let us appreciate it, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm hopeful because I know all of you are going to go home and ponder these things and figure out what you can do with this information. 
And in your own way, you're going to make a difference. Thanks for coming out tonight. Come back again. Take care, everyone. That's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow.